Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for uh, setting up this event. Is that volume sound all right, or is it too loud? It's good. It's good. Okay, we'll leave it as it is. Um, thank you for setting up this event, and obviously doing a lot of very good publicity and getting a great audience together. I'm delighted to see that. <laughs> right. Enthusiastic, too. So, what am I talking about? Obviously, I'm talking about this, but uh, in fact, this is my title slide of uh, my talk. So I'm talking about effective altruism, specifically in respect to global poverty. And let me just say a little bit about effective altruism first. I see effective altruism as an emerging movement, uh, a new movement that really seems to have gathered strength just in the last couple of, ideas, uh, couple of years. Not, not really a totally new idea. The idea has been out there for a long time. The idea is uh, both that we should be altruistic in the sense that we should be concerned about the welfare of others, not only of ourselves and not only of our own local community, we should be more generally. And effective is a new focus on trying to have the biggest positive impact that you can. Uh, so not just thinking, well, um, I'll give something to charity, so uh, when somebody comes along door knocking or waving a tin or something catches my eye, I'll give them some money. But rather, I'll make sure that I give where it will have the biggest positive impact, the big biggest impact for good. And I think that there's, that's where there's some new thinking going on, to get, and that combines with the idea of seriously living our lives in a way that, that gives a real role to others and to where we can make the biggest difference that defines this new movement with uh, a lot of people getting involved in it in a way that, um, although I've been interested in this issue, been writing about it since one of the very first articles I published uh, in an academic journal called Famine, Affluence and Morality back in 1972. I've been following the whole issue since then, but I have not really seen um, the growth of uh, new groups and people involved in this and the kind of excitement that it's generating um, in all of that period uh, until just the last year or two. So that's why I think this is a, an important moment to start talking about this and uh, giving you this message. Now, um, in that article that I mentioned, Famine, Affluence and Morality, I started off with a little example about uh, the opportunity to rescue a child from a shallow pond uh, and save a life at low cost. Instead of doing that, um, I want to show you a very short video clip of something actual, and let's just hope that the video runs. Yes. Uh, well, okay, so, I'm sorry, the, the, maybe we have a little bit too much light on the screen. Is, can, we, um, can we adjust these lights? Uh, yes, okay, I think we can do that. Okay, now, sorry, there's actually, I think the audio is not coming over. So what has happened, let me start it again if I can, uh, maybe I can't. All right, what has happened is this girl who's called Wang Yu, has been hit by the van that you saw before in a street in the city of Foshan in China. And these people, you've just seen two of them, have uh, either walked, in the first case, or in this case, cycled past her without stopping to offer any help. Um, I'm not going to show you the entire video, um, but in fact, more than a dozen people walked around her, cycled around her, uh, and ignored her. And during that time, a second van hit her and ran over her legs as well. Uh, eventually, a woman who was, uh, I think, uh, gathering recyclables or something along the street, uh, saw the child and did stop to help, raised the alarm, um, and uh, alerted her mother, who was not far away, but obviously had not been paying as close attention to where her daughter was as she should have. Um, Wang Yu was taken to hospital, but she was too severely injured. She died. The uh, incident was all captured on this uh, closed-circuit uh, television of the, uh, of the street and was then shown on 
Chinese television uh, news services and did cause a significant outcry in, in China. People saying, um, what's, what's happening to us? What kind of a country have we become that people can ignore um, a child who is obviously lying in the street and in need of assistance? Um, but I'm not showing this in order to say anything particular about China. Um, such incidents have happened in other countries, in Western countries, um, uh, not been captured on video in the same dramatic way, but we know that there are occasions when people have not stopped to help uh, both children and adults. So the reason I'm showing this is that um, I think that when we look at something like this, and I could see it on your faces when you were watching, um, there is a sense of, of shock. Um, there's a sense uh, of horror at people being so callous. And I imagine that you, we, you think, and we all like to think, that we would not have been like this, that we would have stopped to help that child. Am I right about that? Is that sort of the reaction that you have? I see heads, heads nodding. I think so. Um, and I think it's, you know, I, I hope that you all would have stopped to help. I think it's uh, likely that uh, all or almost all of you would have stopped to help in those circumstances. But um, before we congratulate ourselves too much on being better than the people who walked around this child, I think we have to ask ourselves about other emissions where we might not look so good now. Okay, we're getting the video again. That wasn't quite my, t my attention, intention, sorry. Um, okay. Not quite sure what I'm supposed to be doing here. Uh, okay, I think we're getting there now. No, we're not getting there. Yes. Okay. So, I'm not sure why the projector is flickering a bit, but you'll have to put up with that. I'm sorry. Um, so, this is the most recent report that UNICEF, the United Nations uh, Children's Fund has put out. It's the 2012 report, came out in September 2012, on child mortality around the world. Uh, you probably can't read it up the back, but the first line is good news. It says, more children across the world survive their fifth birthday, live to their fifth birthday, than now than ever before, according to this new UNICEF report. So that's, that's great news. But the second paragraph says, the total estimated number of under five deaths fell from nearly 12 million in 1990 to 6.9 million in 2011, the year of which this report was compiled. So here's the good news. The mortality has fallen dramatically from 12 million in something like 21 years to 6.9 million, despite the increase in the world's population. So as a proportion of children, it's uh, even greater. It will be more than half child mortality as a proportion. But the sting, of course, is in the figure that is given at the end. There are still 6.9 million children dying every year before their fifth birthday. And the report goes on to point out um, that uh, these, the majority of these children are dying in developing countries from avoidable poverty-related causes. And it's not that we can't prevent these deaths. It's not that they're dying from diseases for which we have no cures or for which cures are inordinately expensive as they are for some diseases that people die from in this country. Um, on the contrary, um, we can still dramatically reduce this number of deaths by very simple things like vaccinating children against measles. That's something that has been one of the factors in reducing these deaths, by reducing deaths from uh, malaria, uh, by providing bed nets, I'll say more about that in a moment, um, by reducing deaths from diarrhea, which is something that people don't die of here, firstly because their drinking water is safe, um, whereas in many parts of the developing world there's no safe drinking water. Um, secondly, there's sanitation, which also reduces uh, the incidence of diarrhea and makes the drinking water safer. And thirdly, of course, if a child is brought into hospital suffering from severe diarrhea, they're immediately rehydrated, which is the main cause of death, dehydration in children with diarrhea. And 
uh, they don't die. And the rehydration is an extremely inexpensive treatment, but you need to have um, somebody who knows what to do. Uh, you need to have a fairly simple salt solution available that uh, you mix with water. Um, you need to have that in the rural villages where children are dying, and you need to have a little bit of training given to families or villages so they know what to do. It can all be done. It is being done, and it's the kind of thing that has brought down that death toll, but obviously it's not being done sufficiently. And it's not being done sufficiently, essentially, because of uh, lack of funds. So what I'm arguing is, showing that film from Foshan, is um, ethically speaking, does it really matter that you don't have to walk around these children who are dying? Psychologically, obviously, I understand the difference that it makes. Uh, psychologically, when you see the child who needs help in front of you, you feel a strong pull to help, and that's why we would think that if you don't help, there's something seriously amiss, as people did when they saw that video in China. But trying to think of it ethically, I think the important question is, can we effectively help? Not, do we have the psychological urge to help? If we have the knowledge and we have the ability, then morally, and we don't help, morally, how different are we from those people who did not help little Wang Yu? So, just to make further the point that we can help, here's one example of a way in which we can help. This is the website of the Against Malaria Foundation. Um, it tells you that more than a million people die each year from malaria, 70% of them are children, so on that basis roughly 700,000 of those 6.9 million will be dying from malaria. And um, it's preventable. We know how to prevent malaria. It's really quite straightforward. This is what you do. You provide bed nets. This blue plastic package contains a bed net being given, obviously, the child is carrying it, but being given to the family um, to protect uh, particularly their children, but all of them, from malaria. These are uh, insecticide-treated bed nets. Uh, they're quite long-lasting, um, and they're inexpensive. The actual cost of the net is about $5. The, uh, of course, there's some cost in distributing the nets, taking them to the places where they're needed. Uh, again, there's a, an amount of education in showing people how to use the nets, but it's fairly minimal. So you can protect a family from malaria in that way for very low cost. Um, not every net or every family protected means that a child's life is saved, Children survived before there were bed nets, um, but uh, if you protect them, you will cut the rate of children, the number of children dying from malaria. You'll also reduce the incidence of the disease. And uh, even if you survive the disease, it's an unpleasant one, which makes you feel very ill and weak, um, and it uh, can come back uh, again and again. So protecting people from malaria has benefits other than simply saving lives, but it certainly does save lives. So uh, this is what you can do. You can support the Against Malaria Foundation, and if you're asking, I seem to have a, oh yeah, if you're asking, how do I know that this is a good organization, then here's an answer. This is the website of an organization called GiveWell. Uh, GiveWell.org is where you go to find it. Um, it does in-depth charity research. It's a relatively recently set up organization, uh, set up in 2007 uh, by a couple of young guys who were working for a hedge fund. Uh, these were the boom times for hedge funds. Uh, they found themselves with more money than they expected to have. They started talking about uh, giving some of it away. They said, well, yeah, good idea. We can easily give some away. It's good. Uh, where should we give it? 
Um, oh, well, let's look at some charities. Why don't you look at uh, this group of charities and I'll look at this one and um, let's see which are going to do the most good with our money. Uh, remember, these were hedge fund analysts. Their daytime job was to investigate companies for their hedge fund to uh, invest in. So they were used to getting serious data to look at which is a good investment. But when they went to the charities, they found nothing like this. They, the charities would send them back glossy brochures with pictures, like the picture of the smiling child I showed you, um, and say, you know, give to us, uh, we can save lives with your donation, or we can do lots of good with your donation. But when they wanted to go a little more deeply, they said, well, how do you know that this actually works in saving lives? What's, what's the evidence that it saves lives? Um, how much do you think you spend per life saved? Um, essentially, they got uh, blank responses from most of the organisations. They said, well, we know it does good, but they didn't refer to any studies of how it does good. Um, they didn't provide any figures about the cost of the good that they were doing. And so um, these GiveWell guys, um, Holden Karnofsky and Ellie Hassenfeld and their names, they decided that this wasn't good enough, that there was a kind of vacuum here. And uh, with support from some of their other colleagues at the hedge fund where they were working, they left the hedge fund and set up this organization. So it's now a, a non-profit that exists to evaluate charities. Now, if while I've been talking, you've been looking at this pie chart, you'll see a rather remarkable fact. They have evaluated hundreds of charities now in the six years that they've been going, and they are recommending 1%. In fact, currently, if you go to their website, you'll find there are three charities that they're recommending. But I don't want you to get the wrong impression by that. Some people are already a bit prejudiced against charities and are going to come out of this lecture saying, do you know that 99% of charities do no good at all? <laughs> okay, so that's not what this shows. As um, you know, was famously remarked, I think, by Rumsfeld, who I don't like to quote in the uh, relation to the weapons of mass destruction, um, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Right, well, um, you get what he was trying to say. He was actually wrong. Um, the <laughs> weapons of mass destruction were um, absent in this case. But, but here... It's, it's the absence of sufficiently rigorous demonstrable evidence that the charities are really effective, are really going to do a good job with your money, that leads to the grey 99%. Um, so uh, some charities are just too difficult for them to evaluate. For instance, one of the charities that I think is a very worthwhile charity and um, have donated to all my life and um, have not been deterred from donating by the fact that Give Well do not recommend it, is Oxfam. Um, I actually started off donating to Oxfam at that time when I wrote that article in 1972. I was at Oxford, a graduate student, and um, uh, I started donating to Oxfam because their headquarters were right there in Oxfam, Oxford. I went and talked to them. I was impressed by what they did. I was impressed by the people there. I've continued to follow what they do. I went back to Australia and got involved with Oxfam Australia. I'm now in the United States and I'm involved with Oxfam America. Um, and I think they're, they're all doing a good job. But they're very large and complex organisations. They do a lot of different things. And uh, when GiveWell looked at them, it looked particularly at Oxfam uh, America, um, it basically said, there's too much going on here and we can't really give an opinion about if, you know, the difference that your dollar will make because it may go to this, it may go to this. Some of these things maybe we could evaluate, but um, other things are more like one-off things. Um, let me perhaps give you, um, let me be a little bit more specific on this. So, obviously I'm mentioning this because GiveWell does recommend the Against Malaria Foundation, the one I put there. In fact, currently it's its top-ranked charity. It does that because there have been randomly, uh, random control trials run on the distribution of nets. This is the kind of gold standard of evaluation. This is the standard used when a drug company is, uh, says, we've got a drug that is going to cure some disease. And uh, NHS, looking at this, deciding whether it's going to pay for it, will say, well, show me the evidence. And the evidence is going to be a controlled trial 
We got uh, doctors to randomly select half their patients, give them this drug, um, and the other half of their patients got the old drug, or maybe they got a placebo if there's no drug. And um, because it was, they were randomly selected and because more of the patients who got the drug got cured or lived longer, so we know the drug is good. So it's the gold standard in that area, and it's the gold standard in this area too. If you say, okay, so we're going to distribute, there's 500 villages in this province, we're going to distribute nets in 250 of them, randomly selected, um, but in all 500, we're going to find out the incidence of child deaths from malaria, and then we're going to see if that differs in a year's time or two years' time in the villages where we've given the bed nets at. Um, and it does. So uh, GiveWell is happy to recommend that, and then it looks at the cost of doing this, and it finds it's, it's cost-effective by comparison with other ways of saving lives. But So Oxfam might do a thing like this. Um, in Mozambique, uh, recently, the inheritance laws meant that when, a, when the man uh, in a married couple died, his family inherited the property. So you imagine a couple marry, they save up their money, they perhaps buy a farm, they work the farm together for 20 years, then the husband dies, and the farm goes to the husband's family. The woman essentially is a pauper. I mean, you hope in many cases the husband's family will uh, provide for her to some extent and help her, but they don't have to. And in-laws don't always um, get on terrifically well. So this was a terrible situation for many women in Mozambique. There was a local women's movement that was trying to get this law changed. Um, Oxfam went in and assisted them. Um, helped them with uh, some money, resources, um, talked to them about getting organised throughout other parts of the country where they went and, and so on. And the law was changed. So that's, I think, clearly a good thing, clearly a desirable thing. But you can't run a random controlled trial of changing property laws in different countries. Um, there, aren't, there isn't the same situation, you, can't, you just can't do that. So that's one of the reasons why GiveWell says, you know, it's too hard to evaluate a lot of charities. Um, but you, can, you might still, I think, quite reasonably decide that you want to donate to some of those charities. You like the way they work, they work you support it. Um, but if you really want to say, if you really want to be critical and say, how do I know that my money is doing good, then um, the charities that uh, Give Well recommends, I think, is one good way of doing that. So I think we can be reasonably confident. Let me mention also, um, there's another organisation which has a website giving what we can, um, which also does some work at uh, looking for the best charities. And there's, um, they also recommend just a few charities, and there's uh, an overlap between the charities they recommend, though currently they're not uh, totally uh, identical. But um, it is really important to be um, selective in your charities. Um, this website says some charities are up to a thousand times more effective than others. And let me give you an example, which I ha have actually taken from uh, Toby Ord, who's um, the person who set up Giving What We Can, which is an organization that uh, the Life You Can Save uh, works cooperatively together. So um, on, the, uh, on your left, you have a blind person with a guide dog. Um, now, we would normally think um, a charity that provides guide dogs for blind people is a good charity. It's a good thing to do. It's good that blind people can be more independent and more mobile um, and get around. And that's true. Undoubtedly, that's true. This is a good thing. But if we really want to be effective, we have limited resources. And the question is, what can we do with those resources? So what we want to do is to think about that case and think about the cost of that case and think about some other ways of helping people who are blind or are going to become blind. So um, the example that Toby Ord took is people who have a disease called trachoma, which is the most common cause of blindness in developing countries. It's caused by a microorganism that gets into your eyes. 
Um, it gets, in, gets into the eyes of children. Uh, at first, it's simply an irritant. It can go on for a long time, just being something of an irritant. But eventually, it starts to scar the eyeball. And uh, first thing you notice is that your vision becomes blurry. And that may take quite a long time, may take as long as 15 years where you go through this stage where your vision is getting more and more blurred. And then, typically between 30 and 40, um, you will actually become blind. Now, this is something that is quite easy to prevent. To prevent uh, trachoma is, is not difficult. Um, again, you, it's something you can do very cheaply. Um, estimates vary. Um, I think Toby actually used a figure of $20 that he took from a research paper on preventing trachoma. Um, some people I've talked to say that figure is too low. But what we have to compare it with is the cost of the training of the guide dog, and you also have to train the person to use it. So that, um, these are US figures I'm talking about now, sorry, but you can translate them. That, at least in the US, costs around $40,000. Uh, and it's probably not that different here, it might be a little bit lower. So it's not hard to do the math on that um, in terms of, so if indeed you can prevent somebody getting to a coma for $20, um, so you're talking about 2,000 people who can be prevented from going blind for the cost of providing one person with a, with a guide dog. If the cost is not $20, but let's say it's $100, which is the upper end of those estimates, okay, well, it's still 400 to one. And although it's clearly a good thing to have a guide dog, um, preventing somebody having 15 years of low vision and then 15, the rest of their life of blindness, which is quite likely to be another 15 years or so if they're 30 to 40 and they've gone blind in a developing country, um, their life expectancy will not be ours, but uh, will be significant. So that seems to me to be a better thing to do. So that's why I think effectiveness is really extremely important to look into. And... It's also the answer to a question that I'm often asked when I talk about this topic, and so I'm um, going to anticipate it now. A lot of people say, well, there are people who are poor in this country too. Shouldn't we be helping them? Uh, my answer to that is, um, I think it's obviously regrettable that there are people who are poor in this country. I hope that the government will... Um, take steps to protect those people, and um, in this country I can say that with a little more confidence than in the United States, because although I know you've had cutbacks in various areas of, of uh, social security, um, still uh, it's much better provided than it is in the United States. But um, even there, the cost-effectiveness of what you can do is much less in the developed country than it is in the developing countries. Um, this kind of difference is reflected in other areas as well. It's reflected simply in the difference, for instance, that, um, uh, that uh, income makes. You, you can think of it by saying, so um, what's, what's the poverty line in a developed country? I'm not sure what it is in uh, the United Kingdom. In the United States, for a family of four, the, government, uh, the government's poverty line is $22,000. Um, that's the line below which you get certain benefits that you don't get um, if you're above it. And um, uh, it's also for statistical purposes, looking at the, the number of people in, in poverty in different areas. So um, the World Bank sets the line of uh, what it calls uh, extreme poverty at the purchasing power equivalent of $1.25 a day with some inflation adjustments. That's not a $2013. Let's roughly say it's maybe £1.50 in, um, in current terms uh, a day in this country. Um, and that's the purchasing power equivalent of that. So it's, it's adjusted for differences in how far your money goes. It's, it's, you can buy the same things in the developing country that you could buy with $1.50 here. So you can think about trying to live um, in, in that way. So think about somebody who is on that kind of income, some, somebody who is on, let's say, uh, uh, 500 pounds a year. 
um, and think about how much difference you could make to their lives if you were to um, give them another 500 pounds. And some people are advocating direct grants like that as a way of alleviating poverty. Most organizations are not doing that, but uh, GiveWell, interestingly, has just added a group called Give Directly to its recommended charities. It thinks that is a good thing to do. Anyway, it's easy to see that if you gave 500 pounds to somebody who is on 500 pounds a year, you're going to make a very significant difference to how they live, to their food security, for instance, to their ability to afford any health care at all, um, to their ability to send their children to school if they're in a place where, where that costs money or where they then have to take their child away from perhaps some, some way of earning some money. Um, whereas if you have somebody who's on, uh, let's say, the US level of $22,000 or its equivalent, um, and you give them 500 pounds, you're not making a huge difference. So I welcome it, no doubt, but you're not making a really big difference. So that's why I think we ought to be focusing on people in extreme poverty, because that's where our resources typically will go furthest, and that's, um, if we want to be effective altruists, that's what we ought to do. So um, this is my last slide. Um, in fact, this is the organization that um, I've set up with support from others, uh, The Life You Can Save. Originally, this was um, simply something that we put up as a website to go parallel to the book, um, the book of The Life You Can Save. Um, and in order to enable people who didn't get the book to um, think about this issue uh, and to pledge to give a portion of their income uh, to organizations that are effectively seeking to reduce global poverty. So what we have on the website is um, some recommendations for organizations. Uh, we do recommend the ones that GiveWell recommends and we do recommend Oxfam and we uh, have a couple of others. We're a bit broader. Um, we also have um, a scale of what it is that we're suggesting that people should give. Um, so uh, give, giving what we can has a 10% a recommendation that it's, it asks its members to pledge to give 10% of their income. Um, that's fine, but I think it's um, for some people uh, on low incomes that might be difficult, and for other people on high incomes they could quite easily give significantly more than 10% without um, really incurring any hardship at all. So um, I've come up with a more sliding scale that starts off lower than 10% and that ends up higher. And um, I calculated the percentages um, roughly with a view to saying, suppose that all or most of the people in the developed world who were middle class or above were to give according to this level. How much would this raise? And what kind of impact would that have on the problem I'm talking about? On the problem of extreme poverty, the problem of these 6.9 million children dying, but also the problem of people living in conditions that are essentially conditions which we don't think are adequate for a decent human existence where you don't know that you're going to be able to get enough to eat or to feed your family um, throughout the year. Maybe after harvest time you're fine, but then you know that times will come around where you have to restrict yourself to one meal a day to try and make uh, enough of it last, and you're not even sure that you can do that. Your child falls ill, you can't afford any health care, you perhaps can't even afford the transport to take your child to the nearest health care. You don't have safe drinking water, um, perhaps uh, the women in your village have to walk for an hour or two each day to a stream to get water because there's no water in your village. That stream is polluted, so then they have to boil the water, which means they have to collect firewood in order to boil the water, so that's more time out of their day, um, or they don't boil it and their children get diarrhea and die. Um, those are the kinds of conditions. They, they, their children can't get an education, um, and so they can't really move out of this 
poverty trap. Um, those are the conditions which uh, I was trying to say, what would it take to really end widespread extreme poverty? I don't anticipate, at least in my lifetime, perhaps this can happen in the lifetime of some of you, I don't anticipate seeing a complete end to extreme poverty because there are going to be places that are difficult to reach, there are going to be uh, governments so repressive and so corrupt that you can't really work in those countries effectively. Um, there are going to be civil wars which are going to cause people to be in poverty. There are going to be uh, a whole range of catastrophes. So there will be uh, pockets of poverty enduring, I think, for the foreseeable future. There will be um, uh, short-term suffering from circumstances that are difficult to deal with. But the idea that there is just permanently more than a billion people living in extreme poverty in a world which has so much affluence as well, which we can spend money on things that we obviously don't need, that are, that are just things that we enjoy, um, whether they're small things like um, uh, having a coffee and a croissant or something just for the fun of it, or whether they're large things like uh, traveling overseas for your vacation or buying uh, some new clothing, which is sort of in the middle, you know, a lot of things. But you can all think of things that you've spent money on. I would imagine, well, maybe not all of you, but the majority of you can think of things you spent money on in the last week which you didn't really need to. And that's, that's a level of affluence that um, is unthinkable for the billion or so people in extreme poverty. So... Um, I think that situation can be changed. I think that situation where uh, there's this lasting, widespread extreme poverty is something that can be changed. And uh, I think it can be changed if we have a further growth in this movement of effective altruism. A further growth in the number of people who are prepared to say, yes, I want to do something meaningful and significant with my life, um, I want to be able to have the self-respect that comes with saying I am not one of those people who walk past the child in need, whether the child is in front of me or whether the child is simply one that I know about. Um, don't even know about an individual child but know that there are such children. Um, I want to be able to think that I am somebody who lives up to my values and uh, who acts on the idea that the lives of people everywhere are just as valuable whether they're people in London or people in Britain as a whole or people anywhere in the world, no matter what country they're in. If we can increase the number of people, continue to grow the people who are prepared to do something about that and to feel that that's an important aspect of their life, uh, something that they want to make important. And if we can continue to have this focus on getting the charities that are effective, on getting charities to demonstrate their effectiveness as far as they possibly can, on having ways of saying, um, here are the good ones where you can have confidence that you're making a difference, um, then I think we are in a situation where um, within not too many years, um, within a decade or two anyway, we can um, eliminate this widespread situation of uh, more than a billion people in extreme poverty. So I want to make sure that you have time to ask questions about that. I know that I've raised a lot of different issues and um, there are uh, things that we can ask about a whole, both uh, the ethical position that I've staked out that I haven't described in any detail and some of the factual questions as well and some of the questions about growing the movement. Um, I want us to have the chance to talk about those things. So I'm going to stop at that point and I'll look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much.
Hi, thank you very much. Um, two very quick points. The first one is, shouldn't we be campaigning for justice rather than charity for global justice, changing the, the rules of world trade and so on, which are deep causes of uh, these situations? And second point is, um, aren't the victims of climate change the new lives that we can save? Um, mm -hmm. Now, that's not something that we can save by giving to a charity, but that is something, those are lives that we can save by... Um, changing our behaviour and lobbying for our um, politicians to um, change the way that society is run. Yes, um, both very good points. Um, so the first point about uh, you described it as justice rather than charity, um, but you referred to changing the world economic order um, in order to in order to uh, make it possible, make it easier for. Uh, the poor to work their way out of poverty. Um, this is certainly uh, a possibility that, um, that I support. My uh, uh, friend uh, Thomas Poggy, who's a professor at Yale University, has written about this, um, and uh, we've, we've discussed our different approaches, and we agree that uh, our approaches are complementary. They're not uh, contradictory. So um, uh, he has argued at length in his... Uh, uh, writings that the world economic order is an unjust one in that the trading arrangements which uh, the World Trade Organization in particular imposes favors the rich nations, makes it harder for the poorer nations to, to uh, be on fair terms and trade agreements. He's also referred to uh, the resource uh, problem, the fact that um, oil companies can, for instance, uh, buy the oil produced by Equatorial Guinea, which is a tiny African country run by a repressive dictator who lives in uh, enormous wealth and has uh, well-armed well military forces supporting him, while the vast majority of his country live in extreme poverty, despite the fact that the country is um, on a per capita basis, um, you know, you might say comparable to Saudi Arabia or uh, one of those countries which is able to uh, does provide, at least uh, for whatever other faults it has, uh, doesn't have uh, people living in extreme poverty. Uh, so um, there's clearly something wrong going on here that uh, it's, it's not unreasonable to regard this wealth as being stolen by the dictator, wealth that belongs to the population as a whole, to the country as a whole, as being stolen by the dictator. And the Western oil companies which deal with him are therefore receiving stolen goods. So I think uh, that's a, a vivid example of another uh, injustice that ought to be remedied. Um, should we be working to change this situation rather than uh, do what I've been recommending? Um, I don't really have any objection to have people say, okay, so I could have put some time and some of my own resources, some of my money perhaps, into the Against Malaria Foundation, but I'm more interested in a larger systemic change and I'm going to put it into an organisation that is working strategically to change one of these things that I just mentioned. Um, if, if you really think that this has a chance of success, that it's um, a promising strategy for bringing about change in this situation, I think that's good. I think that's, a, that's an excellent thing to do. Um, it's really, I think, the difference between um, a low-risk, limited payoff and a high-risk, high payoff. So if you give money to Against Malaria Fund, a foundation, I think uh, there's a very high probability that you will do some good, that you will save the life, the life of a child or protect a family from getting malaria or maybe uh, more than one family. Um, so you can be reasonably confident that that's what you will have achieved for your donation. Um, if you put it into the efforts that you mentioned, um, you may, with others, be contributing to an enormous change, which makes a big long-run difference. On the other hand, you know, changing the world economic order, changing the World Trade Organization, uh, even smaller things which produce somewhat greater fairness. For example, reducing the agricultural subsidies that both the EU and uh, 
and uh, the United States put on their agricultural products, which make it much harder for uh, the developing countries to sell on the world market, because even if they're producing more cheaply than those countries, um, with the subsidies they get undermined. Even that is politically extremely difficult to do. So you may put in a lot of time and effort, and in the end it may make no difference. And it depends really what uh, you prefer of those things. So this is becoming a very long answer, but that's, these are important questions, and that's one of the reasons why I, I uh, didn't talk for too long. So let me say a little bit about the second question you asked, which was about climate change. Um, I totally agree that climate change is going to be worst for the world's poorest people. Um, they're the ones who need, to, uh, need the climate to be stable for them to continue to grow their food. Um, in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, in some uh, developing countries, 70%, 80% of the population is reliant on agriculture for the food they directly produce, and in most cases they're reliant on rainfall. And if climate change means that rainfall patterns change, those people are going to become refugees or, or starve. Um, in Bangladesh, there are, I think, 20-something uh, million people whose farming lands will be inundated if sea levels rise by one metre, um, which is quite within the range of predictions um, by the end of the century. Um, and so they'll also be refugees. And that picture is repeated in many low-lying areas around the world. So, yes, again, this is something that we really ought to be trying to stop. We can reduce our own greenhouse gas emissions. So um, you may think that you want to spend some money on doing that, on um, insulating your house, for example, to uh, reduce the amount of fuel you use or being more effective um, in various ways, uh, converting to solar or something like that for your hot water. Those are various things that you can do, and that may also be a, a good thing to do. Or again, you can politically campaign for your government to do more than it is, and for the whole EU to do more. Um, so it, it's much the same choice, I think, there. Um, you may feel we ought to take more responsibility for our own emissions, and we ought to do that. But once you get to do that, beyond that, the political campaigning is similar to what I said about the, the justice issue, I believe. It's a, it's a high-risk, high-payoff strategy. But I certainly think that that's a major issue. Okay, sorry to take so long. Let's go to the second question. Where do we have that? Over there. Hello, thank you very much. I have uh, two questions on whether your preference satisfaction, your deterrent approach is the best grounding theory for uh, altruism. The first point is uh, since preference satisfaction, your deterrentism is committed to maximizing preference satisfaction and and it seems like it's a personal well maximizing personal well-being and it seems it can't accommodate a lot of interpersonal goods such as fairness equality or mutual respect so if we are just committed to maximizing personal well-being this sort of uh, prudential reasoning whether you think this is the best theory to ground uh, altruism. And my second question is... Can I, can I just stop you there? Because I think, uh, obviously, you're a philosophy student. Um, you've read some of this. I think not everybody in the audience is. Um, so let me just give a little bit of background so some people may not quite know what you're talking about. Um, so, because I, did, I didn't mention it, obviously, today, right? I didn't really talk about underlying theories. Um, and I think the... I didn't... Uh, that, that's deliberate. Um, I don't want anybody to think that you have to hold a particular ethical theory, let alone that you have to hold exactly the same ethical theory that I hold, in order to support the issues that I've just been talking about. You can come at that from a wide range of ethical theories, which I think converge on the idea that there's a priority in helping people in extreme poverty. Preference satisfaction is a theory which I have defended um, for much of my career. Actually, recently I've indicated that I have some doubts about it, but um, I've certainly defended it for most of my career, which says that the, the, what we ought to do is to maximise the satisfaction of the preferences of all beings affected by our actions. So that's what you're asking about, and you're questioning whether that leads to the conclusions that I reached. Okay? All right. So with that background, what's the second question? Uh, thank you. Um, the second question is... Okay. Yeah, would it... Uh, disadvantage the lives and the people that you want to save because 
a lot of people, poor people in poor countries, they have very simple desires. They have a lot less desires than affluent peoples in uh, Britain and uh, United States. So if we are trying to maximize well-being, <coughs> and I think uh, to bring them to the same level of well-being, a lot of resources would go to the affluent people to satisfy their desires. But the people, the, the poor people, and uh, maybe animals too, they don't have a lot of desire given their lack of psychological comple uh, uh, complexity. So whether <coughs> preference satisfaction due to terrorism would be an approach to ground the conclusion. Okay, so I, so I think in a way both the questions are asking in the same general area. Um, so let, let me say I, I said something um, that um, recently I've been, uh, you know, ha had some doubts about um, whether preference utilitarianism is the best version of of utilitarianism. The classical version, just for comparison, for those who are not philosophy students, um, the classical version of um, Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill and Henry Sidgwick was a pleasure-pain utilitarianism. We should maximize pleasure or happiness. We should minimize pain and suffering. Um, I think that those two views actually um, don't, you know, don't really differ very much when it comes to the goal of reducing extreme poverty. Because I think that um, when people are suffering um, in serious ways, then that preference, those preferences are extremely strong ones and there's a lot of suffering. So, you know, the, the uh, desire to cease for the suffering, to cease for the pain to cease or not to happen in future, is a predominant desire, and that's why I think they, they point in the same direction. So I think some of these desires that I've been talking about are very basic ones. Nobody wants to suffer from a disease like malaria. It's very unpleasant having malaria. Um, I, I know because I once had malaria. I went to New Guinea when I was a, a lot younger and picked up malaria there. Um, obviously, I went back to Australia and got treated for it. Um, uh, it came back once or twice, but it's gone. Um, but it's very unpleasant having it, even though my life was in no danger. So I certainly wanted to feel better when I had it. Um, uh, and I was suffering, so those two versions of utilitarianism converge. And of course, um, uh, you know, my friends and parents um, were worried about me. And had there been any danger that I was dying, they would, that I would die, they would have been much more worried about me. So both their uh, unhappiness at my condition, at my risk of dying, and their preferences, again, would have converged. Now, I think that these are very important preferences. You mentioned, well, the affluent have all of these other preferences to, um, uh, I don't know, to get more of an education, to attend lectures in philosophy, to go to the theatre, to um, uh, listen to music, to hang out at a trendy bar with your friends, whatever it might be. But I think when it comes down to us, most of us would admit that... Um, the desire to avoid the, some of the bad things that I've mentioned, being seriously ill, having someone you love dying, um, uh, to become blind, the example that I mentioned, that those are much stronger. That it's not as if somehow you know, there's a, a scale from minus 100 through zero to plus 100, and that the difference between the worst pain you can have, which is the minus 100, and a state of indifference, just being, you know, you might as well be asleep, you wouldn't care, um, that's zero. And then the good things that these affluent people do um, that I just mentioned, you know, they're not at plus 100 on this scale. Um, I think that the, the difference between them and the indifference level, the zero, is much less than the difference between the indifference level and the, the worst suffering. And, you know, I certainly think, feel like that about, about my own situation. So I think that this view does suggest that we ought to focus on those who are worst off, that that's where we can have the biggest, the biggest payoff. Um, and as I said, I think a lot of other theories, ethical theories, also point to that conclusion. Okay, do we have another question on this side? Um, thank you. I wonder what you think about um, approaching this um, effective altruism from a virtue um, ethical viewpoint, because as I understand it, it requires to have a certain attitude towards one's life. And can't one habituate that better if one takes certain virtues into account, which one needs to kind of educate? Because um, I was wondering while you gave the talk how 
um, one can kind of convince others that they become effective altruists. Um, how can we right. individuate that? Right. Um, I think that this account does work quite well with a virtue uh, theory up to a point. So, again, for those of you who are not philosophers, there's a debate that goes on um, about different approaches to ethics. Um, the approach that I take uh, looks at the consequences of what we do and judges' actions as right as to whether they produce the best consequences. Um, some, that's called, usually known as consequentialist ethic, which utilitarianism is the best known example. Um, there are deontological approaches that have rules and say you should not violate this rule. Um, and there's, I guess, the, the third major stream uh, that's become influential again recently, it goes right back to Aristotle, is um, that we should try to develop certain virtues. We should focus on, on character and virtues. Um, so my view is that the, um, the virtues are important, and they're important for the kinds of reasons that you mentioned. We want people to be altruistic to an extent, and we don't want that to feel like an imposition from the outside. Um, because that somehow, well, for one thing, people are more likely to, to stop doing it. It may not stick. Um, and people are, um, are you know, more li less likely to, to take it up. We want, and also they're, they're not going to enjoy doing it as much. And um, you know, I certainly want people to enjoy their lives. So making this a part of your character, that you are a generous kind of person, you are the kind of person who wants to help others, and also you're the kind of person who wants to think about doing so in the best way, is developing a, a certain character, and that's valuable. Um, in that sense, you could say there's not really a conflict between virtue ethics and, and consequentialism, but they do somewhat different things, I believe. Um, I don't think you can work out which character traits really are virtues unless you have an independent sense of what are the goods that you want to achieve. And if you think the goods that you want to achieve are, for example, reducing pain and suffering, making people live better lives, then it's having decided that, that being generous becomes a virtue. It's not like that we somehow can intuitively see that generosity is a virtue in itself. We define the virtues in terms of its consequences, and um, that's why I think we want those virtues and we want people to become those kind of people and we want them to enjoy what they're doing and flourish uh, by helping others. And I hope that's the kind of character that we can increasingly have. Uh, we'll come across to this side. Okay, I think you're getting it there. Is it working? Oh, yeah, 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 it's working. Um, so, like, I know you make use a lot of the time of the proximity argument and the argument that it shouldn't matter whether you're um, near to someone or far away from them and that shouldn't determine whether, um, ethically, it shouldn't determine whether you want to help someone or not. And I think by the same argument, time as well shouldn't be, a, like, an arbitrary um, standard of whether you should help someone or not. So I think helping people in the here and now should be just as important as preventing poverty in the future um, ethically speaking, maybe not psychologically speaking, but ethically speaking. But prevention, to me, seems to suggest that you have to get to the source of poverty. Um, and the source seems to me to be competitive accumulation, putting profit before people. And I think, like, you're right to say that charity only goes so far in preventing poverty. So doesn't this then commit you to an ethic of people before profit? And doesn't that, by proxy, commit you to political anti-capitalism? <laughs> it's a very nice little logical argument in a, a short series of, of steps. Um, I mean, I totally agree with the slogan, people before profits, right? I think that in, in that sense, you know, if we ask what are the ultimate ends, what are intrinsic goods, as we might put it, um, then it's people or the well-being of people that is the intrinsic good and, and profits are not. But we have a system um, in which um, people invest uh, and expect returns on their, uh, on their investment, and, and that's the profits. And that's the system that we have uh, for 
producing most goods, at least in, in uh, uh, societies that are at all above a, a minimal level of development. Um, and for me, it's really hard to imagine replacing that system in any foreseeable future. Now, um, I say that with some reluctance because um, I think that uh, capitalism is a system that has many flaws, but I really don't think we have yet developed a better system. Um, there are a variety of ideas floating around, but I think we need to have things that really can prove themselves in practice. Uh, obviously, uh, various non-capitalist systems were tried in uh, uh, a number of countries from 1917 onwards, um, and they led to repressive systems of government in which the same aspects of human nature that we see and dislike in capitalism reasserted themselves in a different form. So, you know, we still had elites and we still had um, people who were at the mercy of elites. The elites looked after themselves um, and uh, used their power in various ways to ensure their continuity in much more comfortable circumstances than the masses. So, um, I'd like to think that we can do better than that, but um, as I say, it, it really hasn't worked. Even when you look at um, smaller, more idealistic attempts to, to live cooperatively, um, things like the kibbutzim movement in Israel, um, it seemed to be a much kinder working alternative to capitalism on a small scale, but it too seems to have been eroded. It's, I think, no observer of the uh, Israeli kibbutzim or collective settlements um, would deny that they are not really flourishing, that um, uh, they're clinging on to uh, the ideals of the past generation. And so we need to at least see something working, maybe not at the state level, but something working in an enduring way that people join and are committed to and, and want to continue in order to have that, that model before I think we can seriously talk about uh, replacing capitalism as a whole. Hi. Um, I, it kind of relates to the, the global justice question and I guess also therefore the anti-capitalist question as well. Um, I was wondering, when we're making decisions and choices in our lives, obviously uh, we need to be thinking about our moral obligations. and. Um, I, I was maybe at a point where these things might come into conflict between what you advocate and maybe something more what Pogger advocates. Um, when we decide what we should do for our occupation, um, so if I was going now to choose to work for a company which I knew was exploiting people, but I can make a lot of money and therefore donate more money to help more people, I was wondering what you thought uh, would be the obligations for us or, what, I don't know, what, what advice you'd have for us? Okay, that, that's an interesting question. It's, it, that's an aspect of the effective altruism movement that I didn't talk about um, because I wanted to keep the focus reasonably narrow, but um, let me just mention it since you've raised that question. Uh, obviously, one of the ways in which uh, you can be effective is through your career, and especially if you're a student um, or another young person with your career ahead of you, that may be one of the most important choices you can make. Uh, there's another website you can look at, um, set up by uh, uh, another uh, Oxford ph philosophy graduate student called Will Cratch, uh, called 80,000 Hours. Um, 80,000 Hours is the number of hours that Will estimates most of us spend in our career. So um, have a look at 80,000hours.org if you, if you like. Um, so one of the things that he suggests doing is what this question implied, really, that um, maybe a good thing to do is not just become an aid worker or become a doctor who's going to uh, treat people who are ill in the developing world, but to go into a career where you can earn lots of money and then, therefore, of course, you can give away lots of money. Um, and some, some people are starting to do this. Again, um, if you'd asked me this two years ago, um, Will's idea was already out there, but if you asked me two years ago, well, do you know anybody who's done this, who's doing this, I would have said, well, nobody who deliberately has set out to do a career that's different from what they wanted to just in order to earn more money and give it away. Now, um, I know half a dozen people at least 
who are doing this. Um, and some of them have been quite successful in terms of earning um, quite a lot of money. They're talented people and giving away quite a lot of money. You said, well, maybe you, know, you, you might earn the most money in, in working with a company that does something that actually increases the harms that are being done. You might be working for one of these oil companies that's negotiating with dictators, or maybe you'll just be at one removed from that. Maybe you'll be in finance and you'll be raising capital for a company that wants to um, develop new oil reserves in areas where the money will not be returned to the people of the country. Or, you know, maybe it could be a, a whole range of different things. So we, there's a spectrum, I think, on that scale. And there would be some things that I think it would be hard to imagine anyone with the kind of motivation that I'm talking about really being able to wholeheartedly go into that and say, I'm doing this um, because I want to benefit people on the whole and I'm going to earn more money doing it and, and give it away. Um, that's hard, but um, there are other high-paying positions that may be more neutral um, where you're not doing great good with your everyday work, but you are getting well paid for it, but you're not doing great harm either. Um, and there may also be opportunities sometimes to nudge your corporation in a better direction on some issues, saying, look, do we really have to do this deal? Um, isn't there a problem here? You know, even just in terms of bad publicity for the corporation or something like that, there are all these lobby groups out there that will um, damage our, our brand name if we do this. So um, I, I think that the, the option remains, the option of um, working, say, in finance in order to make a lot of money, in order to give a lot of money away, uh, still remains. Um, but for most people, I imagine there would be some things, some places at which you would just draw the line and you would say, um, I really don't want to be involved in this even if it's a way of earning more money because I feel that the harm I'm doing is kind of balancing the uh, good that I'm doing by the donations. Okay, we're going across to this side now. Yeah. We'll go a bit more up the back, I guess. Yeah. Um, do you think it's desirable to move towards a situation in which charities are funded by uh, taxing people in, developing, in developed countries? Or is it sufficient for charities to be funded by uh, voluntary donation? Given that, at least in this country, uh, we don't provide social security by voluntary donation. Yes. Um, so you referred to charities being funded by government. Um, another uh, option that people sometimes ask about is, um, should we simply increase government aid and uh, therefore do away with the need for charities. They're, they're slightly different options. Um, and they vary a little bit in different countries. I think there's a danger in charities taking a lot of money directly from government because then um, inevitably I think it, it can weaken their capacity to criticise government or their um, independence and for that matter the significance of their praise of government. So um, I think actually the the various Oxfams around the world have different policies on whether they'll take money from government um, because they are independent organisations, although they, they work together. Oxfam America has a policy of not taking any government money, although uh, US charities in that situation, some of them get government money or they get donated government food supplies, which is equivalent to government money because they can then sell the food on the global market if um, there's no urgent need for it. Um, and Oxfam America certainly thinks that it's better not to take it, partly because they can then say they can work in countries where the US is not very popular and they can say we are in no sense an arm of the government, we don't take any money from the government, partly because they can be more independent in their criticism of government uh, when they do the wrong thing, and when they do the right thing and they congratulate the government on doing the right thing, um, their congratulations is taken more seriously because nobody is saying, oh, you're just doing that because you're... Um, being supported by the government. So there's, there's, there's virtue in, um, in independence there, I think. Uh, so 
Another option might be to increase government aid because then, like Social Security, it's paid for by taxes. Everybody pays for it. The rich pay more for it. Um, and that's, I, I do think the government aid should be increased. I think that it's one of the good things about your present government that, um, despite the austerity measures, it has stuck to the commitment to raise foreign aid to the 0 0.7 uh, level, the uh, 70 pence in every 100 pounds. Uh, level, which is not a huge amount of foreign aid, but it's a level that is only met by about half a dozen countries. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's better to be at that minimum level than, than not to be at it. That said, um, charities remain um, more flexible, I think, more adaptable to circumstances, quicker to move. It's, it's the difference between the, uh, uh, the little nimble yacht and the big oil tanker. Um, and so they can sense out new situations, they can take risks which governments are reluctant to take, uh, they don't have to worry so much about political flack or political feedback, and generally I think their record is, is better, they're, they're, they're more cost effective than government aid, although government aid varies around the world. Some, some countries seem to be more effective, better at it than others. I think the UK is significantly better at it than the United States. Um, but I would want to keep some charities uh, independently supported without government support so that we can have those more independent, more nimble organisations that are path breakers for what governments may later accept as a proven concept that they're willing to go for. Okay. Yes. Hello. Yeah, just keep it close to you, Matt, then it works. Um, yeah, I just wondered if you could say a bit more about the fact that um, perhaps one of the greatest and most severe threats to the future of the planet is the ever-rising global population level. Um, and although there is a lot of evidence to suggest that with better education and so on, perhaps the um, developing countries may not have such a high... Um, such, such large families. Um, just wondered if you could say where you thought the, the emphasis should lie between delivering immediate aid for people who are currently suffering from illnesses um, compared with delivering education about this issue. Um, I agree with you that uh, population can't go on increasing in, indefinitely and um, that that's a problem and that we we do want countries to move to sustainable populations and um, many nations already have, but some of the poorest nations have not. That's um, definitely a problem. And you're right also to say that uh, education is one way out of that, particularly education of girls. Um, there's good evidence that the more years of education a girl gets, the fewer children she will have, which um, helps with the population problem and helps each individual child because uh, children with more space between them get more of their parents' attention, more resources, and do better. Um, so I'm not sure how to make the trade-off between the immediately saving lives and uh, the educating of girls. Uh, again, I, I think they're both valuable things to do. Uh, in general, trying to get people out of poverty is the way to slow population growth. Um, that's happened with all of those countries that have really moved out of poverty. Of course, they've also had more education as they do so, but they go through this demographic transition where the number of children per woman starts to fall away. Um, and that's what we want to see. So I think if we can uh, reduce poverty, we'll see that result. Um, but if we want to see it faster, a focus on educating girls is going to be a way to see it faster. And uh, I do think that that's an important thing to do can't really make the trade-off between that and giving out the malaria nets or something like that. Um, at the moment, uh, I chose against Malaria Foundation because it is a top-rated organization by GiveWell. At the moment, they're not rating an educational organization. They were looking at a couple. Um, perhaps, again, it's one of these things that the results are rather longer term and it would take more time for them to actually show these desirable outcomes. But it does seem to me that it's the 
the fact I mentioned that the more years of education a girl gets, the fewer children she has, is pretty well documented, so it does seem like education is a good way to go. Um, right here now. Um, I want to talk about uh, spending money on luxury goods. Uh, if you were to say buy a £40 designer t-shirt as opposed to a £2 t-shirt, which for all practical purposes would be just as good, there's £38 worth of help that could be given to people who are dying that isn't. Uh, and you could say that that's an immoral act. To use the analogy that you used at the beginning, perhaps we're in the position of the person who cycles past the... Uh, girl who needs help to go to some leisure activity and we devote our time and energy to that leisure instead of helping out the girl. Um, so with that in mind, how can we ever justify purchases of, lu purchases of luxury goods knowing that if all we wanted to do was survive, all that money could just go to save lives and buy, buying those luxury goods would denying that help to people who are dying. Okay, so um, if the question is how can we ever justify that, um, I think probably the only honest answer I can give you is we can't. Um, on the other hand, that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to condemn every pur purchase of, of luxury goods or to, uh, that, to regard it as something that is seriously blameworthy. Um, because I think that the standards we want to apply for blaming people for what they do need to take account of where most people are at nowadays. In other words, I think, I think the idea of, of blaming people for doing something wrong implies with it something that suggests uh, you're on the wrong side of some sort of judgment of what we can expect from people. And so if you're already giving, let's say you're a student and you're giving 10% of your relatively modest income to one of these effective organisations, um, but that still allows you now and again to lash out on one of these luxury goods and you really would like that designer T-shirt. Um, I'm certainly not in any position to go up to you and say, you've just done something wrong um, and uh, you should really feel terrible, you should feel guilty about what you've just done. Um, I don't think that would be a desirable thing to do. I think given that you're giving 10% of a modest income, you're doing pretty well. You're doing better than, I don't know, 99, maybe 99.9% .9 of how people are at the moment. Now, I would like to change that figure. I would, I would think that that's what the life you can save is, is all about, really. We're trying to get people to see that giving something like 10%, depending on your income, um, is a standard that everyone should aim at who wants to be able to have some, some self-esteem about the way they live. But um, while the standard is where it is now, it's much harder to go ahead and not only give the 10%, but even give more and deny yourself those little things. So um, I think we ought to be uh, acceptance of that, and, and I would say, to answer your question, it may not be justifiable, but it's certainly excusable. It's not blameworthy. Um, one day, perhaps, we'll live in a culture that has internalised these standards more fully, and uh, then we'll say that's not good enough. But if we do get to that point, if we ever get to that point where everybody's giving that 10% or something, then we probably have dealt with this problem. You know, we don't need more than that. That's all of what the economists talk about. Jeffrey Sachs, for example, who was an economic advisor to the Secretary General of the UN and others, say really to get rid of this extreme poverty, we would only need maybe 2% of the GDP of the affluent nations. So if we were all doing that, you would be able to still have enough to lash out for luxury items, um, reasonably frequently even. Um, in the meantime, as I say, we want to judge you by the relative standards. We want to take that into account as well as this more absolute standard. 
Um, we're heading up the back there. I see there's a couple of hands being floating around lower down. Maybe some of the questioners can, the mics can come down before we finish for a couple around the front, but let's go ahead up there now. Good evening. Thank you for your talk. It's very interesting. Give me a lot of food for thought. I'm not a philosophy student. Okay. So, uh, I'm glad there are some non-philosophers here. angle of my question. But I, I just wondered if you had any observations. Um, your, because your talk, uh, I felt, came, came very, presented very much an American uh, vision, really, of, of given, giving, with these, these guys from the hedge fund calculating the quality of the charities and... But I did talk about things that people, uh, English people in, in Oxford are doing. It yes, wasn't only the, the American hedge what fund I want guys. To, what I want to ask you about is that we have... Uh, I want to ask your observations about the fact that we have um, a British phenomenon, which is that we do fundraising through TV, um, big TV charities, um, Comic Relief and uh, BBC Children in Need. It, it, we started with Live Aid. I mean, that, that happened a long mm -hmm. time ago. Mm -hmm. But it's become part of the fabric, almost, of society, mm. that there are these very big charity fundraising events which are, are led by television and, and radio, and which people participate in in very many ways. And um, I just wondered if you'd taken, you know, taken a, a look at this and thought about that and whether you have any observations, really. Because I, I think that those, those big charities do represent a sense of safety for people in terms of giving money, that they do feel that they're giving to something which is accountable mm -hmm. and which distributes in, an, in a complex way. I mean, it doesn't just give to the, to the ones that can do the RCTs. It, it also gives to the ones that maybe actually aren't very sexy and people don't want to give to. Mm -hmm. And are doing very painful, difficult work which doesn't actually have a... Maybe it doesn't save a life, but it does make a huge quality of difference, but not one that can be measured. Yeah. Um, look, I hesitate to say too much about that because I don't really know enough about um, the charities that you're mentioning. I do know a bit about some of them. I know that there was some questions about the distribution of funds with, from Live Aid, I think it was, that uh, I know Bob Geldof was defending, um, but...